So um, this isn't really long. I, I took, um, by the way, I uh, I I, th I think I shared this um, last week, but this is a this is like a one of there's there's a few repositories for this book, you know, people. Um, but this is the one I just I used just to, for one of the scatter plot examples because I thought it looked cool in the book. But really, yeah, this is um, I don't know that we're gonna take the whole hour because this is um, oops. You know, this is um, fairly straightforward. Um, so, yeah, the gist of the whole chapter is about reliability and validity. Um, either he made a couple or they made a couple interesting points. One is like, you know, what the data actually means, quote unquote. Um, and, um, you know, he also made the point, they made the point of saying, you know, learning about reliability and validity is a precursor for learning about variance, correlation and error. And um, yeah, and then a couple other things that I thought were cool that they said in the book was, you know, we take for granted that our that the, we take for granted the measures that we work with, right? So this is a common, you know, problem where, you know, we 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 tend to think, oh, you know, um, we have a measure, so it must be good, and you know, but that's not always the case. So. Um, and yeah, and then also I thought this was a great quote. This is like, as a psychologist who has done survey work for 25 years, I can say, um, you know, sometimes this, this is, there's a, there's a real truth to this, right? Sometimes we are trying to measure something that we all agree has meaning, but which is subjective for every person and doesn't correspond to a thing we can count um, um, or measure with a ruler. So, you know, psychologists were sort of notorious for this, right? Like there is no place inside of us that's called self-esteem or personality or you know um i cube so yeah trying to measure these things that there is um no there there is, is it's kind of tough sometimes but uh yeah some, something cool to think about so i'll just kind of go through um you know the two main kind of is issues obviously validity um is you know, the, the sort of the gold standard uh, for, you know, uh, did someone, I heard someone speak? Oh, okay. Um, you know, this idea of, you know, uh, are you measuring the thing that you think you're measuring? And he also brings up, you know, in the social sciences, um, you know, this idea that oftentimes there's not a gold standard or a right answer. So this can be a really fraught exercise to try to validate a measure when, you um, you know, there is no gold standard. You know, I'll use the example of, you know, depress depression indexes, which, you know, indices, which are things that we use in medicine a lot, like things like the PHQ-9. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but, you know, nine questions to kind of measure depressive symptoms, right? So I guess you could call that a gold standard, um, but, you know, it's um, it's not perfect either. So there is there is no sort of perfection when it comes to things like um, validity. Um, so reliability is, is just the precision and stability with which you measure something he, um, brings out a couple, um, concepts, one, uh, which is, you know, we're probably we're all familiar with the idea of test retest, um, reliability. So across, you know, some time period, can we see relatively stable measures of whatever, um, we're trying to, to, to measure? And, you know, this is a tricky, this can be a somewhat of a tricky one because, you know, depending on the thing you're trying to measure, there may or may not be test retest reliability, or there may be, um, you know, over a longer period of time, there may be less so, and, um, you know, over a shorter period of time, it's probably more so. Uh, and then the idea of iterator reliability, which is, you know, um, can two or more people sort of look at the same phenomena and see you know, the same thing, um, you know, over, over a, um, you know, over time. The, um, fun fact, my first, I actually worked in child psychiatry and um, infant mental health in my, like 25 years ago. And one of my first jobs was to watch time-lapse video of infants sleeping. And we had to measure for a variety of things. Like you can actually watch a baby sleep and, um, 
figure out whether or not he or she has just entered REM sleep based on certain kind of like what are called clonic movements. And so, yeah, we, we spent a lot of time as a lab, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how to identify those things. And, you know, we had a lot of sort of measures uh, or, or measurement experiences to try to figure out, okay, you know, where are we not coming to um, the same understanding and, and whatnot. And so, yeah. It, um, how did you not fall asleep within five minutes? I mean, the most peaceful yeah. um, subject of study, I suppose. Yeah. Well, it was there were there was it was it was time lapse. So like an entire like eight hour period would be um, like an hour. You know what I mean? So it was pretty fast. Um, but yeah, it was yeah, it was cute for a while, and then yeah, it would um, it was it was definitely annoying. But the point is, is you know there is no. I mean, there certainly is. Um, you know, have agreements, but yeah, it's definitely not something that we would, um, you know, see any, there's no, there's no perfection. Let's put it that way. There's, there's only imperfect humans, um, either agreeing or disagreeing with each other. So, um, yeah, one of the, okay. So, um, oops, hold on, make sure I, yeah. So uh, one, one of the things I kind of wanted to do and this, he brings this up is, you know, um, and this is these are two of the exercises uh, from from the back of the chapter. But can anybody give me a scenario of measurements that have reliability but not validity? Um, any anyone have any thoughts on that? What I thought about um, when I was reading this chapter, and they were started to talk about validity and um, and these things, it's I started thinking about reproducibility and replicability, which are big in science, right? In, sure. in, in anything that we do, because obviously R helps us a lot with reproducibility. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are our, our own enemies and we sure. don't necessarily code for us or others in the future so that we can, and others can understand what we did, right? With commenting and all of that. Yeah. But, um, but I think that's huge also should be added to this um to, to when we're talking about validity and um what's the other concept I forgot reliability unreliability yeah because yeah, yeah. I think those four things need to be like a well it's not a trifecta anymore right but it's the trifecta or whatever yeah so where you have these four principles that are um mm -hmm. that are huge yeah anybody else have any thoughts about now you're you're kind of talking about practice like you know sort of workflow as it relates to creating a reliable and valid outcome just to kind of I mean which is totally like absolutely important but I guess what I'm trying to think about is a met something that we measure in medicine and it could be in education it could be in ecology um as 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 we've talked about last time, um, that where we where we can measure something reliably, but it doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means. I Maybe mean, that's another way. Ah, to I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, I always struggle with that. Right now, I'm writing a paper, and I'm actually struggling with that because it's like this is the hypothesis that I want to see if I can test mm -hmm. the way that I'm modeling it and the way that I'm measuring it. Is it really a proxy, right? Is it really answering the, 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 the helping me understand if this hypothesis is, mm -hmm. I, yeah, that that's, uh, I really don't have an answer to that, but I think I, I, I yeah. sometimes it's very easy, right? Like yeah. um, when you're, I, I suppose when you're doing something, I don't know, simple, but if you're studying causality, then you need to see if, if this is actually causing this, right? If right. really driving a red car is going to make me um have more crashes or crash my car more often as if as opposed to having a white car right like something like that that's right. easy yeah, to so measure like or something the, yeah maybe um and then confounding variables and all of that so yeah i don't yeah. know are we going into that design we, territory well i will i not i don't think today because there's not a lot of design stuff there's only like sample stuff too but any ron anybody else uh, have any like ideas about like what's a reliable but not necessarily valid uh, measure something that we measure in in science I, I think for the first question this can be applied to uh, a good research project where you can reproduce the results but you don't have it it's not uh, your conclusions are wrong okay 
So mm -hmm. you made you made the wrong conclusions, and you the results are 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 right. So mm -hmm. you have the correct measures. It's reproducible. It's re replicable. But the conclusions at the end, mm -hmm. the the outcome of your research, uh, which is maybe maybe you are trying to work on a a measure or a mm -hmm. metric to look at a phenomena. This is wrong. So it's not valid. So you, because of the assumption. Yeah. As, and this can be applied to many things. So sure. this would be uh, someone that lack the, maybe the domain knowledge or lack some expertise. This is where you fall for in the first scenario. Yeah. So the, the second scenario would be maybe a complex phenomena. So there is a, an established phenomena, but mm -hmm. you, uh, the, this phenomena is quite established and well understood in one field, mm -hmm. okay? Maybe in medicine, and you are a computational scientist, and you would like to make this more quantitative, yeah. So you yeah. would take this and try to study it, and you will come with some results. Mm. Uh, so the phenomena is valid. You might agree with the exper experts, but it's not reliable because maybe there was some some uh, calculations or some uh, computations in your workflow that are not, uh, yeah robust or maybe there was some randomness so yeah well let me give you guys an example of the first one um maybe maybe to kind of like focus us in a little bit because yeah all these are great points um but but um, like once again just to kind of redirect us we're looking for like something that we measure as a potential outcome or it could be a predictor i'll give you an example of coming from you know i'm have some experience like in educational psychology and educational you know sort of science and stuff um, I don't know about maybe a couple of you, but um, well, Ron, I'm sure you probably took something like the SAT or the ACT before you went to college, maybe. Oh, yeah. All those. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you all have um, in your respective countries or uh, educational systems, if you have some kind of like standardized test. Um, but we in the, in the States, we have, you know, the SAT, which um, do you know what that the SAT stands for, Ron? Standardized aptitude test, I believe. It was originally called the scholastic aptitude test. So by the way, what does aptitude stand for? I mean, I'm sorry, this is like I'm 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 really giving throwing out the quiz questions here. I don't know. Actually, it's, I kind of think we're just being aptitude, right? So how good how smart well, think, you are, I guess, or something, or how right. Well, in education, <laughs> we, we typically have two types of things. We have aptitude, which is sort of what is our ability going forward, and then achievement, yeah. which is what have we gotten through so far, right? Right. So, so sometimes we take standardized tests, which are achievement tests, which is like, okay, how much does, you know, Ron understand American history, say, you know, so we give him some sort of right. you know, some kind of final test that would measure your ability for that, right? I don't um, think I do then, very well. <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah. So, um, so by the way, so, uh, so the SAT was originally designed as a, it was called the scholastic aptitude test, right? Because the belief was, is that this would be a great way to identify who would be a successful college student, right? Well, I, I think you all can know where this is going, right? What Does anyone know anything about the predictive validity of the SAT on your final college GPA? I Probably very low. It's really, really bad, right? And yeah. in fact... The SAT is no longer called this, at least I should say, I, to my last understanding of this, I haven't looked it up recently, but about 10 years ago or so, they stopped calling it the scholastic aptitude test and they just call it the SAT test, the SAT, right? It's it, the, the acronym actually doesn't mean anything anymore because it, they've finally given up on this idea that it's an aptitude test for future performance in, in education, right? But if you took some teenager and you gave them on on four consecutive Saturdays, you know, gave them some version of the SAT, is it likely that you would probably get roughly the same scores unless they were doing some kind of like learning or, or strategizing about how to take the test better in between? Let's just say every, you know, seven days we gave them or or doing something to make it worse <laughs> or make it make it worse. Right. 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 So the point is, is. The SAT and most standardized tests we can call being reliable, you know, because like they tend to get, you know, they, they do these these companies, you know, the ETSs and these companies that make 
standardized tests, they tend to do a really good job of making them reliable. But the harder thing is, is like, how do you create something that's a valid? So remember, because the whole idea of the SAT is not just about where you are now, it's about predicting where you're going to be, right? So one of the types of validities we might care about is what's called predictive validity, right? Which is exactly what the SAT supposedly cares about as a, as a measure. And it's it's not great. So I would say the SAT is a, is a great example, right? Um, um, and the next slide I have some, I'm going to kind of um, ask you to think about um, something in medicine uh, related to this. But for now, let me just say this one other thing. So the second question, which is, you know, give an example of a scenario of measurements that have validity, but not reliability. Now, if you remember uh, in this one, the, the, the bottom put here, sometimes we are trying to measure something that we all agree has meaning, but which is subjective. Um, I guess what I, one of the things, so you might say this scenario here in the, in the final quote is kind of an example of something that maybe is valid, but not reliable. My, me personally, I don't know, I, I don't want to speak for the authors, um, but me personally, I was taught that if a measure doesn't have reliability, validity isn't even a concern because there's nothing to be talked about, right? If you can't measure, measure if you can't reliably measure something, there's no point of even talking about validity. Does that make sense? It's not a measure. It doesn't qualify to be a measure, you mean? Right, exactly. So if you can't even get like consistent, you know, results for the measure, if you can't even get like, um, you know, the, 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 the measure itself to be consistent and to be reliable and all that stuff. And for the same two people to get, you know, kind of the same, you know, if, if it's an observational kind of measure, are they going to see the same thing? That would be my, the way I would look at it personally. If, if it's not reliable, forget about validity because you well, got yeah. Isn't reliability kind of a continuum, though? I mean, some things, nothing is completely reliable. There's always going to be some kind of noise. Oh, well, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah no, but I mean, I, we're talking, obviously, we're talking about, like, sort of, you know, real um, cut and, you know, we're kind of, we're talking black and white here, which I realize isn't necessarily the reality. Yeah. But if you had lower or, like, kind of poor reliability, talking about validity is almost, in my mind, at least, is is foolish, right? Because you got you got to fix the reliability issue. First. Well, and, and vice versa, I guess. I mean, and, why, even, why even worry about a valid? It's not valid, and yeah, I don't care how reliable it is either. <laughs> well, right, but see, like unlike the SAT, there there are a lot of measures that can have things like predictive validity, right? So the SAT yeah. just happens to be a really bad one. So yeah, yeah. there's a lot of great, like we're called patient reported outcomes in, in medicine that you know are good predictors of you know mental health issues and you know um, quality of life and stuff like that. So. Yeah, they have both validity and reliability, right? Um, I guess it's really easy to sell a measurement that's reliable in the, you know, without having that much validity. <laughs> it seems like. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like here's my measurement. Wow, that's really precise. Okay, great. Let's, yeah. <laughs> right, but I mean, remember, Let's keep like, doing that. yeah, but, but just as, as as a psychologist, I will say this: like, you know, measurement, like for especially for things like IQ, is what put us on the map as like a science, like right. 150 years ago, right? So, you know, the Paris um, school system paid, um, you know, um, God, what's his name, ben, um, Alfred Binet, like, you know, to create a a test to kind of figure out who should be in like special ed versus, you know, sort of main line, main track or whatever you want to call the education system. That's how it all started in the, you know, the 19th century. And yeah, we've been spending, you know, over a century now trying to make it increasingly reliable and, you know, to create multiple versions of it so people can take it multiple times and not get, you know, practice effects. But yeah, of course, we can all sit here and say, well, you know, IQ tests don't have any validity or the, you know, the, we can complain about them. I tend to think they have a lot of validity, maybe just not in the ways always that we think. But um, yeah, it is something, the precision is is something that was probably more focused on because that's really something we can intervene on in the present moment. Most validity measurements need yeah. other it's, stuff like that maybe is even perspective, you know? So sometimes measuring validity takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So that's one thing. You, All right. Maybe, you just maybe think of that because uh, in, in my business or what mm -hmm. I was doing mostly, which is more for sales type uh, analysis, 
there's so many like very reliable measurements that people use and people think they're valid and they use them to try to make decisions. And a lot of what I was trying to do is to explain to them, no, these things, yes, okay, the you can look at the person's you know orders per day or whatever. It's not a reliable, it's not a valid predictor of how well this salesperson is gonna do in the future. Yeah. I guess I would have used the word reliable, but I, I might probably meant valid because it's pretty reliable. It's you know yeah. <laughs> pretty yeah. easy to measure. But, yeah, I don't know. If that, well, I, I don't know. Once again, I, I feel bad. I'm using American examples for not a fully American um, group here. But like, I don't know, Ron, if you were like into football at all, but, you know, with the combine and like the draft is coming up. Right. And so they, they have all these players do like, you mean the World Cup. What's that? Or the, well, not the World Cup. Right? Sorry. No, the um, American right? football. American football. Right. And so one of the things that they do to test um, the best players is they ask them to do as many bench presses as they can with 225 pounds. Right. So what, can you imagine like, okay, so trying to use how many bench presses they did in the combine to predict how many, like, you know, what their statistical output will be as a professional athlete, like in five years, you can imagine has completely no validity. Right. But it's highly reliable. Right. Because, you know, what you can lift, you know, on day one is, is probably a decent predictor of what you can lift, you know, a week later, right? Once you're, you know what I'm saying? So maybe it's easier to spot or to That's very good say point, if, if, um, maybe it's easier to spot if something is reliable as opposed yes. to valid. Maybe it's yes. more tricky to see if something's valid, right? But yeah. reliable is just not so straightforward, but easier, I suppose. Easier. Well, it's 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 more intervenable. Inter, it's it's easier mm -hmm. to intervene upon it because we can, you know, we can try different things to improve the measurement. We can add questions. We can add pieces or take them away. And yeah. So this 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 is like you know, a, I yeah. you probably don't want to keep pounding on this, but you just gave me another great example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Share. Because the sports world is full of these kind of things. Yes. It's like in baseball, we've got like ERAs and all these ratings, all these, you know, ratings and statistics. And most mm -hmm. of them are not very valid measures of the, you can show they're not valid measures of the sports, the particular athlete's future performance. Absolutely. And then we have the counter example too, because we also have these unreliable measures, which is kind of like scouting, you know, opinions like, oh, this guy's like a, you know, a have, you know, he's like a 48 out of 100 hitter or something like that. Some rating, some arbitrary rating scale. Yeah. very unreliable but yeah very interesting. yeah I, I would but i would i guess i would only push back to say i'm not even sure how valid it is right i mean that's lot, true <laughs> yeah i mean it's well, no, and, and, I, and i understand like you know, some of this is tough because some of the stuff with like sports analytics is is highly qualitative and it's you know it's messy and i don't mean to say that we shouldn't listen to the qualitative piece but um yeah, I mean, so sports is is full of these, right? Um, well, let me let me let, let's, let's focus on. I mean, yeah. this is my own bias because I I work in medicine, right? And I work in patient preference and in, in, in pharmaceuticals. So, um, I, I want you to think about the concept of health and wellness, right? Which is a huge thing, right? I don't know if you all are like following, but like wellness is the hot word in all of medicine right now. It's not just about you know, being alive and, you know, sort of ambulatory. It's about, <laughs> you know, it's about being well. Does, that mean, does everyone understand what I mean? Yeah. I mean, well, actually, I should, I actually, I, I don't even know if I know what I mean, right? So what are, how could, how can we measure if someone has a high level of wellness? How would we do that? Well, the ones that I've heard, I don't, I don't know, because wellness is, um, so it has to take into account mental health, physical yeah. health, your yeah. environment, right? right? And so many things that you cannot control. Right. But for health and wellness, what I've heard is um, when they start focusing a lot on physical measurements. So I right. remember I have many friends who are um, dietitians or nutritionists, nutritionists, I suppose it's a way word. And they were always talking about circumference, like weight circumference. Yes. And that's like, they, they would always say that, no, 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 that's like the measure to know if someone is either unhealthy because they're too thin or yes. unhealthy because they're too heavy. But I, I think it's not so clear cut, right? Because someone can have the perfect physique, but then their mind is like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Fried or right. something yeah. like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Y'all know what, probably know what BMI stands for, right? Mm -hmm. I hate that. But yeah. body mass index, right? 
So, um, so I, by the way, I, I at one point, I, I, you know, I, I haven't done it recently, so I'm forgive me. I think it's like you, you take um, total body weight and divide by, you know, height and your some... height squared. Squared, but it has yeah. to be in centimeters. I think centimeters. Yes. Um, so is that fair to say, like, you know, obviously, you know, if I go get my BMI measured today and then like three days from now, it's probably going to be the same. Unfortunately for me, it will be roughly, you know, the same exact number. Right. Um, but from a health standpoint, how good is BMI at predicting more? Does anyone know like how well, how well it is, how good it is at predicting um, mortality and morbidity? So mor mortality obviously is death. Morbidity is... Wow being, you know, well enough to function in society, in your life? To be ambulatory, or I don't know what the word you use, but um, I don't know, but I, I assume it's not that good. It's not that great. Yeah, it's, really? I, mean, well, at least I should say it's, we still use it, but like, you know, for a long time, it was like, you know, if you were, if you remember, well, I don't know, it's still kind of going on with, health, your, with your healthcare company, like they measure your BMI and they go, oh, you know, you're in this range that we're concerned about. So if you lose some weight, you know, we'll, we'll give you a break on, you know, some of your, your um, premiums or whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it tends not to be a really great measure. Now, that, that being said, it doesn't mean it's useless. It's just, you know, I think we've always, we've always sought some kind of singular index or indices that would reflect health, right? So BMI, um, you know, resting heart rate, um, there's a bunch of like physical things. Then, of course, as Gabby pointed out, yeah, when, it, when we start talking about wellness, it's not just enough to be like physically, you know, capable of doing things. You have to have a sense of, you know, um, you know inner peace. No, I'm inner peace, or I mean, it's hard to even, you know, it's hard to even frame how we want it. But yeah, you want people to feel well and you know, and and thriving in some some. Yeah, I would, I would question using you know mortality as a measurement of happiness either right so well, sure, a long sure, time yeah. be miserable so, yeah yeah but yeah. well, you're getting the point here right which is yeah. there's a tons of i mean so like oh and and, and by the way so when you go one, one of the things that i don't do this as much when I, I used to work at cleveland clinic which is this you know the second largest or one of the largest healthcare systems in the world and you know they have you know all these uh, one of the things that they've really done in the last and all hospital systems that do this now is like when you get to the hospital what do you do you fill out your paperwork but now you answer a bunch of questions about anxiety, typically, and depression, quality of life. Any of these ringing a bell for folks when they go? See? Yeah. Yeah. So those, I mean, tend to be pretty reliable, although, you know, things like anxiety and depression, you know, they're not, I mean, if you if you go too far apart, you know, there's, you know, these are things that can can change because they're, they're, they do have, you know, sort of malleability, so to speak. Um but yeah, they tend to be pretty valid from some perspectives um, because like, okay, so um, like there's this thing called the PHQ-9, which basically is nine questions about depressive symptoms, not about whether or not you have depression. Does that, make, does that distinction make sense? Um, you know, for, for a doctor to diagnose you as having major depressive disorder, that's a, that's a, you know, that's a much bigger issue, but like to give someone a questionnaire with nine questions you know, just to be able to say, hey, this person might be at risk or might be is demonstrating, you know, a high level of symptomology. So there's a lot of like, in the literature, there's a lot of this kind of couching of language as a way of making things more reliable and valid, right? So if you're, you know, if you're saying, I'm going to make the perfect measure to, to, to measure depression, you know, clinical depression in humans, I mean, good luck, you know, that's, that's probably going to be you know a fail i mean like you you need typically need doctors just for legal reasons but also it's hard to just come up with a number of questions that are going to give you a sense of hey this is you know um all the things you would need to measure depression and you know if someone has a clinical depression or something like that so um yeah I mean, he gets into this in the book and you know they talk he talks a lot about this human um development index um which you know is full of things like um well, actually, I would say most of the stuff that they measure is, well, it seems to me anyway, like, you know, we're talking about like state, you know, income and um, 
I forget what the other things were like GDP and stuff like that. I mean, those are all things that, you know, are highly reliable, but of course, like, what do they mean? Right. What is income really? I mean, yeah, there, that's another kind of thing in like medicine and social sciences is this idea of socioeconomic status. Right. So that's how much money you make. It's your education. It's sort of like, you know, where do you live and what kinds of cultural and educational capital is there? There's a whole bunch of things, right, that people can measure to really get at that. So taking something from being highly reliable to then also highly valid, it's it's a it's a job. Let's put it that way. So anything else um, you know, that I can we can talk about with this? Is this make does this make sense a little bit? I mean, I guess remember like you know, most of the a lot of your earlier examples were about kind of the whole research process, which, you know, by the way, like, you know, being reliable and valid with that, there's no question that's important, but I almost want us to kind of focus in on, you know, a, the single variable idea, right? Whether it's, you know, IQ or, you know, some single indices for health or for, you know, personality or, or whatever the thing that we're trying to measure, it's really hard to come up with something that does both really, really well. Um, especially as it gets more and more sort of um, psychological, right? So when we talk, you know, like um, like Gabby mentioned with wellness, it's it typically it has a huge mental health component, right? Because what good is being physically well if you're, you know, unhappy from a sort of psychological perspective? So um, I would say my people are, are definitely responsible for creating, you know. Um, constructs and by the way when i say construct that's just the things in quotes right so health and wellness is this construct that we've we've come up with right that we're trying to like you know before we have anything we have a construct that we're trying to measure and so we have to kind of figure out okay how can we measure this thing reliably and and in a valid way and you know and and sometimes it can include self report right so and then they talk about that you know self report you know by the person him or herself that's can't it can be a great tool, but it also has its own sort of unreliabilities and invalidities and stuff like that. Um, and then, but of course, there's other like medical, you know, things like you know, blood pressure and you know, heart rate and all these you know, these things that we kind of talked about. So, any other questions or comments about this? Ho hopefully, I'm making sense. I don't know. No, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, this is something like, you know, I would say as a, like a psychologist who also mostly is a statistician now, I think a lot about, you know, when people, someone gives me a measure, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, okay, like, what is this thing actually measuring? What does it really mean? And, you know, what would I, you know, what kinds of bivariate or multivariate relationships should we see with this and other things? I mean, that's a, that's a big part of my job, I would say. Um, okay, so then anyway, we talked about sampling. You know, and so I don't know. I don't know about y'all, but um, so they talked about selection bias, which is you know, if we um, forget what what what's the, I didn't write this quote in, but oh yeah, so if you only include okay, yeah, so if you're if you're um, if you're trying to like figure out people's satisfaction with public transit, you know, if you only interview people that are riding the bus or the trains or whatever you know the public transit is, you're not doing a great job of measuring overall attitudes right because there's a bunch of people that chose not to ride the bus or the trains maybe for you know no good reason or maybe because they really hate the bus or the train but the point is is um selection bias is sort of can often be rife in um you know um the kinds of you know sample i'll give an example of this so one of the things i used to do is um a lot of observational research on people with migraines, right? So, you know, this is a huge problem for a lot of people in this country and, and throughout the world, I would imagine, when they have different kinds of like migraines. Well, at Cleveland Clinic, we had this huge, uh, I don't know, like clinic that were, where people would come from all over the Midwest and even from all over the country to get treated or to, to talk to some doctor, right? So we would do these studies looking at like healthcare utilization of of these people and like you know what their symptoms were like and you know how much money they spent on treatments and this and that but you could say as interesting as that sample is is this is a very specific population these are people that are highly motivated to treat their condition for you know because maybe they're really on their end of their rope or, or whatever this it's really frustrating um 
but yeah, so like there's a, definitely a selection bias in our in our sample, but it's also super rich because you know it's hard to get people you know who have a lot of um, sorry, it's hard to get you know people who um, you know you can only get the people that show up, so to speak, right? So um, anyway, I brought this up. Uh, does anyone know what this this um, graph refers to? Just to add a point to what you were saying, um, I remember my advisor, my PhD advisor, he would always say, um, there's always going to be bias here and there. The important thing is that you confess your sins. Oh, right, 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 yeah. So, when, so then the, when you're, yeah, yeah <laughs> in the paper or whatever you're, yeah. reporting this just confess your sins and then yeah you know, it's not well, gonna be okay but at least people know yeah ron do you know what uh what this is what this picture of the plane refers to i vaguely remember something but these were planes that came back and people were looking at where the bullet holes were and of course right. not a representation of where bullets hit because the ones that hit sensitive places didn't come back <laughs> exactly Basically. so uh, this, the u.s air force during world war ii or the military or whatever uh, they were trying to figure out what's the best way to like um, make planes, you know, more impenetrable or, or less, you know, um, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, make them sturdier, I guess, and you know, stand up to, to, to shooting. And so they would do these types of studies here where like they would take and they would map where all the various holes were on these planes that came back. Right. And so, of course, what they did was then they, they, they would create these like, I guess, like shielding or they would try to do something to sort of beef up um you know the uh um you know the the armor these, they add armor yeah yeah the armor on like the wings and on you know these places here so all the red dots and things were, were designed to be like um you know oh let's, let's make these stronger well the problem is is you don't need armor in those places because all of the people in this sample that they they made this graph out of they survived they lived right <laughs> So they 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 you know they 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 did all this like armoring and this you know kind of um, creating this stronger plane infrastructure or whatever and nothing changed you know there was no improvement on surviving because they didn't have any of the data for the people that died right so you can imagine you know if anything all of these red dots are telling us is all the places you can get hit and still live right because that's the only people in the survey so anyway. I don't know, like this is one thing you, you hear all the time in, in um, kind of, you know, survey and, and, and sampling kind of stuff. And so it's officially called survivorship bias, you know, um, and this happens in medicine a lot. You know, we can only oftentimes only interview and get data from people that have lived instead of passed away from cancer or from other, you know, diseases. And this so is like, like those experiments, well, not experiments, like those reports or with all the respect to everyone, but... When people say, yes, I died, and then I, I when I died, I um, floated out of my body, and I had all this um, outer body experience, and I saw the doctor in the right. in my room, and my family were crying, and all of that, and all of that, and then they came back, obviously, they were revived or something, right. and then there's that, yeah, they, they saw the tunnel and all of that, all of those reports are... Mm -hmm full of that of that bias i think right right and so yeah but, and but the problem is that it's still we we still don't know the people that didn't come back right so there exactly. are yeah so the problem is is um we we still don't know anything about the non um returning planes or the you know the people that don't you know that they, they, they just keep going into the light as you as you kind of point or out. the ones that don't remember because yeah, i can't remember sometimes yeah i'm sorry i just i saw a clip on something like that where yeah yeah no, anyway absolutely. it was silly but it's yeah it's one of those things in yeah. science where if it's not reproducible reproducible then it's you know you question the validity but anyway we're going in circles here i'm sorry yeah no but problem. yeah um yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, just continue continue yeah um well so that was it for like the sort of those like, so basically the main gist was you know validity reliability sampling i mean we didn't he didn't go into any of these in, in super great detail i just kind of used these as um kind of the things um and then he has a really great line which is all graphs are comparisons right i mean this is one of the things i think most the average person doesn't understand is like you know we try to measure stuff as scientists we you know i think there most people think we just have some absolute measure of something right but typically it's relative right relative to some other group or some other situation or condition this is what we saw right 
Um, and so, yeah, this is obviously comparative here. We're comparing states. This, I actually ran this, this is actually code that I ran myself. Um, I mean, I stole it from the, the, the GitHub thing I, I posted at the beginning, but yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't, you know, just looking at Tennessee, if, if Tennessee was the only dot on our graph here and nothing else, I mean, we would, we wouldn't really know what the hell to make of any of this, right? Because, you know, we don't have anything to compare it to. So yeah, it's, it's this, you know, we need the, all of the states to see this sort of nice curvilinear kind of relationship, right? Where once we get to a certain point in this human development index, which by the way, is, a, is a, they, they, they talk about this as a, it's a composite measure, which by the way, BMI is a composite measure. Anytime you use more than one piece of information to calculate something that's typically called a composite variable. Um, so anyway, yeah, this was just like, you know, average state income. And, you know, obviously we're not making any kind of um, causal inference here about whether the income is causing the HDI or the HDI is causing that. That's not really important for net, for this discussion. It's more of just saying, hey, you know, we need um, the ability to make comparisons and good graphs allow us the ability to make comparisons. My, um, a friend of mine who was mm -hmm. a professor, of, I'm sorry, I'm very, no, I'm no, good. participate a lot. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, no, it's great. great. But, um, so he would always say, so he was like my professor, my, mm -hmm. in undergrad, right? Like uh, my stats professor. And he would always say um, that he hated pie charts. Yeah. And he was like, those things are the work of the devil. Nobody ever do those. If I ever see one of those in the, one of your reports, I will just, you yeah. know, you lose, you 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 completely flunk the course or whatever you call that. Um, right. And I was like, always, okay, so you're satanizing them or you're like saying that they are the worst thing ever. But why exactly, right? Like I kept questioning him, why, why? I oh, no, no, they're so basic and they're the worst blah, blah, blah. And then I started thinking, and thinking, and thinking. I think it was, he never said this, but I think it was because you are only showing one variable. So it's just, it's just so plain, like exactly what are you doing? And I think that's a good example here because if all graphs are comparisons, then what are you comparing it to? Another pie chart? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, you could. I mean, in fact, yeah, you could. You, I mean, and people have done that. Like, you put pie charts next to each other, which, of course, yeah. I mean, there's better ways of doing it. I think the main issue about pie charts. There are better ways to do it. There, there are better ways, but I think the main issue with pie charts is, is it's all about, like, you know, it's only, um, you're only looking at, well, one variable and there's no context and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, what, I think what you're speaking to, though, is this idea of, I mean, this is, you know, kind of, these were the things. Increasing information, yeah. Yeah, so increasing more information, right? So, you know, they talk about grid plots, which I don't know if anyone's used ggplot, but like you can do these things called facets where you can put like, you know, a bunch of different graphs for different subgroups together and they're next to each other. So you can kind of visually compare them, right? So you want to try to like, I mean, I think not only is it important to make comparisons, but you want to design your visualizations in a way that facilitates those comparisons, right? I think a lot of times we don't think about that. We just think about, oh, put all the information out there and you know they'll figure it out but no if you like you know if you were if you're trying to compare two groups make sure that the you know like whatever you have if you have two separate bar charts one for each subgroup make sure they're next to each other and they're the same colors and you know like you can kind of look you know side by side and and see okay what's going on here i, I thought it was also really interesting that they made this kind of big hullabaloo about you know decimal places which i guess is you know it's a legitimate concern i guess um but um Anyway, yeah, there's not much else to say about that. Uh, any other comments or questions? Um, the last last two things I have is actually I was gonna try to make some like really cool like exploratory like sort of trying try to like show how like a bivariate relationship with like a, a regression line you know through uh, the scatter plot versus a fitted model, which is where we would use more adjusted variables like they do in the end of the chapter where I think they adjust for like age and other things um, for things like mortality, I believe, but I, I, um, I was gonna try to use some other example and I started doing it and then I got super busy and I didn't get through it. No, also. but yeah, that's, that's how they close the chapter with yeah, the yeah. trends and mortality rates and how you can. Yeah. Does everyone understand, everyone understand the difference between exploratory, like a line graph that's exploratory versus like a fitted model. So, you know, if like you, if you're just I looking do. at a, yeah, if you're just looking at a bivariate relationship, 
you know, you're just looking at how the two variables relate to each other. But, you know, if you start adjusting for all of the other potential confounders and covariates and things, then you can get kind of more of a nuanced, you know, relation, look at the relationship, if that makes sense. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You go a step further. Sure. Um, that's it. That's all I, I had. Um, One thing I started to think about, and that's my last comment, I swear. Sure, sure, no like problem. I said, I'm, um, is that I read a book many years ago that was called How to Lie with Statistics. Uh -huh. And it's exactly oh, right. applied here. So it's like you can have a graph and display information in such a way that what oh, yeah. you're saying leads the reader to to something that is not necessarily accurate because you're lying with statistics, right? You're just showing maybe a portion of the graph or maybe you're just showing a portion of the sample or the population or something like that. You are sort of, and obviously the media, newspapers in the past, but now obviously everything is on, it, on the internet, right? But media, you, the, the news channels and all of that, they exploit that. Mm -hmm. so much especially certain channels right but um where, where you can actually show a graph from reliable data mm -hmm. from a reliable source but because of the way you are you're showing it then you are sort of leading misleading the reader i suppose yeah actually i got a great example i can um show you here um i mean i just pulled this up just off the internet like real quick um let me see. So let me just uh, share this. Can everybody see that? Yeah. These are the these are two identical sets of data. Does everybody see that? Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, That's so the only difference is is this is just a dishonest y-axis, right? I mean, so this just is you know. And now, by the way, I mean people do this all the time in the media, and you know they don't get called on it enough. But yeah, I mean, so this obviously looks wildly different, whereas this does not. But I think we can all agree that the right figure is is probably more a realistic interpretation of, of the differences in interest rates, right? Now, yeah. some of that has to do with we have to have sort of in, in, you know sort of implicit knowledge about you know how much interest rates can vary by, and you know like what what's you know how many percentages up and down can it go and stuff like that. But yeah, this is definitely a case of, you know, a um, it's you know you, it's it's not this is not a good faith effort. Uh, the one on the left, I should say. Anyway, um, anyway, um, I do have to leave a, a few minutes early once again. But uh, Ron, you're on mute. Did you have? Um, still I just want to make just want to note that we don't have anybody currently signed up for next week's probability review, whatever it is called. Um, yeah. Uh, if anybody's, I guess, Gabby, are you interested in taking that? I could do it. I, if somebody else wants to do it the following week, but I am presenting in another book club next week. So I'm, I'm, I'm running, to, I'm doing the, um, I'm doing advanced art. So I gotta, I gotta yeah, focus on that. So. I know you are. Yeah. Okay. I'll do it. But I think, Ron, you, it would be the perfect chapter for you because you're a physicist. <laughs> probability. I know. It's true. No, I mean, it's all the math there. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. But yeah, I can do it. It's nothing too too crazy. And if there's anything that I don't understand, then I will say it. But sure. you get yeah, this, yeah. please, Ron, explain or, um, right. or Ryan, right? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, um, I looked through so it. It's pretty. It's mostly pretty straightforward stuff. You could probably kind of go through it pretty quickly because a lot of it's like, oh, you know, about probability distributions yeah. and things like that. There's one interesting example in there that's probably worth talking about, though, and that's that thing about the election. Uh, I read that section of the book and that I read it like a while ago because I happened to be paging through and I go, oh, this is interesting. Like how people use binomial model for like discussing the probability your vote won't affect the outcome is like totally wrong. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. So yeah, yeah, okay. no, I, I like it. That's, that's actually a great, yeah, it's a great one. Um, I got a okay. jet, sorry, um, but I'll, I'll see you guys um, week from today. And yeah. yeah so thank, thank you, Gabby, for volunteering. Yeah. With Only had to All twist right. your arm a little bit. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Bye, guys. Yeah, take care. Bye.